few of the things I've studied over the years, long tail tits, if you've seen those roosting on spring watch and programs like that, they'll be the birds I watch in, uh, in on the south side of Dartmoor. Uh, potter wasps, the horrid ground weaver, roe deer, and quite into bees, I've been filming bees today in Exeter, uh, cuckoos and ants and all sorts of things. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, I, I like to uh, draw and paint, explore the natural world through drawing and painting. Um, in the field, so I, I don't actually, I take a lot of photographs, so I don't really draw um, from them. I like to observe in the field and I just use a basic kit like this, a few, few tubes of paints and pencils and paper and I get out in the field. I'm not sketching the cow here, this is up on the on Whitchurch Down, just near Tavistock. I'm actually drawing the fairy shrimps which live in this ephemeral pool on the edge of Dartmoor. Uh, so I always work in the field and complete all my painting on, on the spot. Uh, this week I've been drawing toads, lots of toads spawning at the moment, uh, so I've been out uh, sketching those uh, for this sort of brief spawning session. And I use these in a variety of ways, so I produce a little uh, nature sketchbook, wildlife sketchbook section in the Dartmoor magazine in its issue. Uh, I've published a number of books over the years and uh, contribute to other books. This is one uh, specific to this talk, uh, the Guide to Mini Beasts, which is a uh, a little pocket guide really that covers an introduction to all the all the mini beasts that you're likely to find in this country. As well as our work as an ecologist, so this is me out on the A38 a couple of years ago uh, looking for insects which live along the road verges and I've recently been working with Stephen Carroll uh, from part of the Back from the Brink project on this ant which lives on the Wildlife Trust Reserve at Chudley Knighton Heath and that's the only site that the narrow-headed ant lives now. In, in England, it has a few sites in Scotland. So we've been trying to actually get it back onto Bubby Heath's field as well. Uh, and that's part of an ongoing project. Uh, as well as drawing and painting in recent years, particularly with the advent of uh, you know, pocket sized di uh, digital cameras, I've been uh, able to take a lot of photographs. And these are the three cameras I've used to take the photographs in this talk. Uh, I used to use an old Sony Handycam, you can see at the back there, but these days I tend to use a Canon SX70 bridge camera and a little Olympus Tough camera. This is a, a neat little camera, uh, which you can, you know, I've been using it this week, you can actually put it underwater. So I'm uh, just breaking the surface film there to photograph some uh, toads under the water there, a lot of sketching. I've also been lucky enough to work uh, with various TV companies over the years. This is. Um, back of Martin Dawn's head there, I've been working with him today, uh, but this was uh, several years ago working on a series with David Attenborough on called Life in the Undergrowth. And I was called in to get various bugs and things to uh, sit still while David did his pieces for camera. And I've also made quite a few short films for the one show with uh, George McGavin, Mike Dildra, people like that. And this one was about oil beetles and I'll be showing you some oil beetles a bit later on. Now, beetles are insects, so they've got six legs. Um, they, insects originated probably about, um, uh, well, about 400 million years ago. So at that, toy, that point, most of the land masses were all together. Um, beetles themselves, I mean, insects evolved probably from crustaceans, which crawled out of the sea, sort of things a bit, you know, some of them turned into wood lice and other groups turned into, eventually into insects. Uh, beetles in particular, uh, would evolve from a group called the Proto-Coleoptera, a Coleoptera is a beetle, um, and that was about 280 million years ago, and then they survived a, a huge uh, mass extinction about 250 million years ago, which wiped out almost all the insects at that point, but the few that survived, the groups that survived, went on to develop into the, the beetles that we know today, and these are some fossils which are uh, about 240 million years ago, which was when the, the beetles that we see today evolved. Uh, there's about a million insect species in, known in the world. There's probably more than that, which are undiscovered. And about 400,000 of these are beetles, uh, which is more than any other group, actually. They're, you know, for, for all the insect groups, the beetles are the most numerous at the moment on current knowledge. Although, yeah, there may be more flies, it's just uh, Beetles have been more popular and they're easier to collect and preserve than flies. So at the moment, there's more beetles now than any other group of animals on the, on the planet. So in Britain, we've got about 4,000 species of beetle, uh, which is, you know, can come as a surprise to some people. There's got so many here. 
uh, a thousand of these are little road beetles, uh, 40 or 80 birds, click beetles, 70 species of those, 200 water beetles, and about 370 species of ground beetle and other groups as well. So it's quite a diverse range of beetles in this country. Many of them are very small though. Uh, this is a, a tiny little ground beetle called Tachys, just a few millimeters long, but this isn't the smallest one. This, the smallest beetles in this country are little tiny feather wing beetles, which are some of them are only about a quarter of half a millimeter long, you know, tiny, tiny little creatures. So in, in some ways, a lot of these, these creatures go unnoticed because they are so small. Uh, the bigger insects, maybe we notice the butterflies and dragonflies and things, but most of the insects are tiny and you've really got to delve into, into the undergrowth to see them. Now, beetles are relatively easy to identify as a group, but they can be confused with bugs. I mean, beetles are coleoptera, which means they have a hardened wing case, the hardened forewings, uh, which cover their sort of wings. Um, and this, this gives them their sort of characteristic appearance. But bugs are similar to this. This is a, a river bug, and this is a shield bug. And these also have these hard um, wing cases as well over the, over the softer hind wings. But the way you can tell bugs from beetles are all, always is if you remember that bugs have straws, so they have a straw-like mouth part, and here's a, a bug uh, sucking the insides out of a, a caterpillar. And uh, so pug, bugs have straws and beetles have jaws, so all beetles have jaws. So that is the, if you look closely at them, you can always tell by just looking at their mouth parts. Beetles, like butterflies and moths, have a complete metamorphosis. So they start off as an egg and they turn into a larva, the feeding, growing stage, then a pupa in which that larva's uh, body transforms into the adult. Uh, and then the adult uh, beetle lives varying amount of time from a few days to a few years. So they have, because there's so many of them and they live in so many habitats, they have very diverse life histories. Also, like butterflies, when they first emerge, the beetles uh, have to expand their bodies and, and their wings if they have wings as well. So they will emerge from the pupa and pump up their body and expand that. And they're often quite pale at this time, which is known as a, a teneral form. So this is a, a little ground beetle. And when it starts off life, it's almost white, but it remains underground until it darkens up and then it will emerge as a uh, hardened uh, adult beetle. Now, I first, I've been interested in natural history all my life, and one of the first things I actually remember when I was about three years old was watching glowworms in our garden on the South Downs in Hampshire. And, uh, yeah, I was interested generally in wildlife, but beetles are quite hard to actually get into, really, I found, because there weren't many books covering them, and it wasn't really until about 20-odd years ago now uh, that I got into beetles by looking for a particular beetle, and this is in the uh, Devon Wildlife Trust Reserve in the Dark Valley, and I went there to look for this beetle and I was very successful in finding it. And it's, uh, it's quite an impressive thing. It made, obviously made a big impression on me, the blue ground beetle. Uh, it's a very rare beetle just found in a handful of sites in, in Southwest England and one in South Wales. And it's an impressive creature because it's a slug muncher. Um, it actually injects the contents of its stomach into the slug, digests the slug into a slug soup and then sucks up all the insides. And I'll show you a few other slug munchers in a minute. So beetles live in a variety of habitats. This is where the blue ground beetle lives in the Dart Valley, the beautiful wooded valleys along, along the river Dart as it snakes its way off Dartmoor. Um, but all sorts of hab any habitat you can think of really, beetles will live in there. So lots of beetles live in meadows, uh, aquatic habitats, bogs and ponds, and also in gardens. And I'll talk about our own, this is our garden in Buckfastley, and I'll talk about that a bit later on. And also, surprisingly, there are some beetles which actually live in beetle collections. So uh, this is a, uh, a collection in uh, Plymouth City Museum, and they have to uh, freeze these boxes every now and again, so you don't get this beetle in there. And uh, thanks for Liam uh, for this photo. And this is a museum beetle, and it eats all sorts of things. It um, eats bits of anything, really, bits of carpet and stuff like that. Uh, but it does like to munch on dead specimens of insects. So. Uh, if you work in a museum, you don't really want to see one of these things. Various ways of collecting beetles. I mean, you can look under rocks and stones, uh, sift through leaf litter. I often use a tr plastic tray like this and just grab a handful of leaf litter, chuck it into the tray, 
and then see what's running around at the base. And it's surprising what you can find in a bit of leaf litter, looks like there's nothing in there, can be actually teeming with life. Pitfall trapping is another method you can use. This is a, a baited pitfall trap. So what I've done here is buried a yogurt pot with a few drainage holes in the bottom and I've put a bit of soil in there, covered it up with a bit of netting so lizards and mice and things don't fall in. And then beetles walking around at night uh, will fall into the trap and then you can have a look in there in the morning. Uh, I put a bait bottle by this one with some fermenting apples in and that's very good for attracting certain sorts of beetles. Sweet netting, has been my sweet netting through uh, low vegetation. Again, you'll pick up lots of beetles that live in amongst the vegetation doing that. And uh, this is an interesting method. If uh, a lot of beetles live in the edges of uh, riverbanks and streams and places like that, uh, they live in little cracks in the mud. So if you splash the mud with some water, they'll often all think that the water level is rising up, so they'll all come running out. And that's a, quite an effective way of finding them sometimes. There are some beetles, most insects of course live on land, uh, but there are a few beetles which actually live in the intertidal zone. So they actually live in amongst cracks in the rocks and they get fully submerged at high tide. Uh, this is a tiny little ground beetle called Epus. It's, uh, it, live, it's sort of very pale and it has tiny eyes and it lives in the dark crevices and hunts for tiny little springtails which live in the silt filled crevices of rocks. And if you run a moth trap or moth bite, you may well attract beetles as well. And lots of beetles are, uh, are good at flying and they can fly at night, particularly water beetles. Um, and on a warm night, you can sometimes catch hundreds and hundreds of beetles. But again, lots of them are very, very tiny. So it might be sort of looking in amongst the, the millions of flies and things in the, in the base of the trap and you might find lots of little beetles. So identifying beetles, as I said, it was, it's quite tricky to get into them to start with. Most of the, uh, there's 4,000 species, as I said, but uh, most of them are quite tiny, so quite tricky to identify anyway. Um, the field guide, the general field guide, the Collins field guide is good for getting an overview of some of the beetles that you, you like to find and some of the more impressive ones. Uh, this is a good book by uh, Paul Brock, a Comprehensive Guide to Insects of Britain and Ireland. It's got lots of lovely photographs of a, a wide range of insects in there. So I, I use that as a, a reference book frequently. Uh, this is a book by uh, Hard, which is, uh, I don't know if you, you might be able to track it down on the, on the internet. It's got all the pictures of all the families of European beetles on. I find this very, very useful book. And I picked that up in Trago actually a few years ago now. They had a whole pile of them, but um, you may be able to track that one down online if you're interested. And if you're really, really keen, if you get really keen on beetles, there's a, a new series of books which cover all the British beetles by Andrew Duff, uh, which have been published uh, over the last few years. I think there's one more still to come out. So identifying beetles, I mean, they're, they're quite tough things, beetles, most beetles. This is a, a little ground beetle. Um, if you, you can actually hold them, uh, if you do it very carefully by holding the, the legs quite close to the body, and then you can look at them with a, a magnifying glass or a little hand lens and have a look at their structures and details. And they really are quite amazing when you see them up close. And I'll show you some of the adaptations in a minute. Uh, this is a, a little guide I, I did when I first got into to, uh, identifying beetles. I went into the museums and used some of their more technical books and tried to um, work out how to identify them myself. So I took photographs of the specimens and then I took photographs of the beetles when I found them out in the field. And that's how I learned to identify them. Switch my light on, it's got a little bit dark now. Um, and I've produced uh, quite a few, these are my personal guide, and, and for quite a few of the families, I've produced some guides to British beetles, and you can download these from my website. So there's some free PDF uh, site uh, links on my website, and you can download the, the guides from there. I'll show you the links to my website at the end. Uh, there's a UK beetle recording website, which has got lots of information about all the British beetles on as well. That's coleoptera.org.uk. And there's lots of other information online as well. So having a look at some of the beetles, as I said, some are very, very tiny. And this one is a, a tiny little mud beetle. And it's uh, you can't actually see the beetle there, but in the middle there, there's a little pale lump of mud. And this is a tiny beetle, a few millimetres long, and it covers itself in a, in a sort of cap of mud. So it's hidden, you just see this tiny little bit of mud moving around, that strange little thing. Um, one of the more striking ones, and probably one of the ones uh, people first often see when they go out, onto, particularly on heathlands, 
uh, is the green tiger beetle. This is a very impressive looking insect. It's coming out this time of year, comes out early in the spring and it can fly. It's one of the fastest, uh, it's actually one of the fastest animals for its size in the world actually. It can run so fast that it has to stop every now and again because its brain can't compute what it's actually seeing around itself. It has these big eyes and huge jaws and it runs down things like little ants and in this case a, a little solitary bee that it's found. So it's a real voracious predator, uh, which why it gains that name, the tiger beetle. Uh, although there are other beetles even bigger than it is than it. This is a, a Tyrannosaurus of the beetle world, the devil's coach horse, a great big rove beetle. And this one's grabbed hold of a tiger beetle. But a few minutes after that, few, uh, it actually let go of the beetle because the tiger beetle has a chemical defense system. So it, um, it produces cyanide from its body and then the, uh, the nasty taste really put this uh, devil's coach horse off and it let the tiger beetles go. Now the tiger beetles, when they're larvae as well, they're, they're predators, they're a bit like an ant lion thing. They, they uh, make burrows in the soil and they ambush ants and other insects which, uh, which come walking by. But they have, um, and this is one in its burrow, so they have a, a strange shape to them with this little notch on the back that so fastens them into their burrow and they can flick their head up very quickly and catch their prey and then drag it down into their burrow. But they do have a, a predator, a little wasp, a tiny little thing which looks like an ant, hasn't got any wings, it's a wingless wasp. And this wasp is super armor plated and it, uh, and it uh, will uh, purposely get caught by the tiger beetle larva, but because it has this armor plating thorax, it, the beetle's jaws can't actually get a grip on it. And then meanwhile, it stings the tiger beetle larva, uh, paralyzes it, and then drags it down into its lair, lays an egg on it, and then the egg of the uh, wasp will devour the tiger beetle larva alive. So even some of these big predators have these tiny little um, little uh, monster creatures with like this little wasp, which are uh, their real arch enemies. And there's a link, if you look on my website, there's a link to my YouTube videos, and there's a little video of that, the Focha little wasp in action. Now, another beetle, uh, one of the first ones people come across is the maybug, uh, the uh, cockchafer. The uh, declined enormously, actually, but they are still quite common, uh, particularly in around South Devon. Uh, they have these larvae, which are rather sort of strange looking grubs, which feed in the roots of plants. You may find them feeding in your lawn uh, or underground in the, in the vegetation. And they hatch into these amazing looking uh, beetles, which fly around. They mainly fly at night during the uh, month of May, as their name suggests, the Maybug. And around here, they're the favorite food of the greater horseshoe bats, uh, particularly where I live in Buckfastley, there's a big colony of these bats. And this is one of their favorite food supplies in the spring. Another chafer beetle, this is uh, down on the coast, particularly around Prool Point, places like that. If you go there in the, in the summertime, you may well see these lovely, beautiful, jewel-like rose chafer beetles and they are rather fabulous looking things. They're often on hogweed flowers and they have an unusual way because they are flying because they just flick their hind wings out from the side of their, their uh, forewings and then they fly along like that. So they're quite, quite good flyers actually. A lot of beetles are quite clumsy in flight but these are, these are quite adept flyers. This is a, a beetle larva, it's a, a, a wire worm. Uh, you may well come across these if you're gardening and digging. And this is the larva of a click beetle. Uh, there's a number of click beetles, as I mentioned earlier in this country. This is a typical click beetle. Um, and these are called click beetles because they have a little notch on the base of the thorax, which goes into a groove on the base of the abdomen. And they can lock this together and then flick itself up. So if you do find one of these and put it on its back on your hand, you'll, you'll notice it will flick up into the air. And they go quite a way to escape from predators. Dung is a, uh, as I said, beetles live in all sorts of habitats. And so dung is uh, a favorite habitat for one group of beetles, the dung beetles. Uh, there's a couple of small ones. And again, there's some big ones around, but there's lots of little ones. Uh, these are just a few millimeters long, little smaller foliaceous dung beetles. Uh, but there are some big ones, particularly places like Dartmoor, you get these big door beetles like this, and they love the dung. Uh, they actually, and this is a, another one which is called the Minotaur beetle. This one prefers sheep dung and rabbit dung, and buries those. And it's called a Minotaur which has these three big spikes along the front edge of its thorax. And as well as dung, this one, I found this one last year up on the, 
up on Dartmoor feeding on the devil's fingers fungus, a type of stinkhorn fungus. And this fungus produces this brown gunk, which smells revolting. So it smells like dung, and it also attracted a dung beetle to it. Now, as well as the, the dung being a food supply, the dung beetles bury balls of the, of the dung in the ground and they lay eggs on it. And the dung is a whole ecosystem because it attracts lots of flies which have their, lay their eggs in it as well and other insects. Uh, and this attracts other beetles. So this is a, another type of rove beetle. And this one will come in to feed on the flies and, and, and other insects which are attracted to the dung. So that's a predator on the dung. And another one, which is quite a rare thing in Britain, uh, called the emus. This is a big furry rove beetle, like a devil's coach horse. It's a very big thing, but it actually looks like a bit like a bumblebee. It's quite an amazing thing. And this, this again is a predatory thing. You can see it's got these big jaws and it'll uh, hunt for other insects around the dung. And when it's finished at one dung patch, it will fly off to another patch to uh, find some more food. And this is a, a dung beetle taking off. So you can see this one does, rather than the rose chafer, which just flicks its hind wings out, this one carefully unfolds its hind wings, raises up its uh, fore wings. It's a bit like something off Thunderbirds. It's sort of leg, middle legs come up to balance it, and then it will fly off uh, again, mainly at night, and look for a nice fresh dung patch. Uh, there is a book by Robin Wooden, uh, who used to work at Exeter University, all about how these um, wings on insect wings fold up. And that's a fascinating book to, uh, to read if you can get hold of a copy of that. Caterpillars, again, common insects in the environment, and there are beetles which specialise in eating these. Uh, this is one which occurs in a few woods on Dartmoor called uh, the caterpillar hunting beetle, Calisoma. And that one comes out mainly in May. Uh, to hunt down for hunt down caterpillars in the oak trees. And this is another one which looks a bit like a ladybird, but it's a, a, a actually related to a group of beetles which mainly feed on dung and carrion. But this one is a specialist at eating uh, caterpillars. It's called Dendroxena, and it's a type of sylphid beetle. Quite an amazing, beautiful little thing. Other beetles uh, specialise in eating plants, so leaf beetles and weevils. Uh, weevils are probably the most diverse group of beetles in, in Britain and in the world probably as well. Uh, lots of different species. This is uh, a particularly attractive one, the hazel oak uh, roller uh, weevil. And this one finds a, a leaf when it wants to lay an egg. The female will carefully chop up a leaf and a bit of origami going on here and it will turn the leaf around, lay an egg inside it, and then the larva is trapped inside there with a food supply and a, a neat package and it can eventually it will drop down to the ground and the larva will pupate inside there. And then the uh, little uh, weevil will fly off and find another patch and see this one displaying its hind wings very well. The biggest beetle in Britain is the stag beetle, the male stag beetle. These are very rare in Devon, they're commoner in the southeast of England. Um, very impressive creatures with the big jaws on the males. Uh, the females uh, don't have quite such big jaws, but they're still quite sizable creatures. Uh, we do in Devon have this one, the lesser uh, stag beetle, and they're quite a small thing. It's fairly common on, in deadwood habitats uh, around, around South Devon, so look out for that one. And another one we do have, which is almost as impressive as the, the stag beetles, this thing, the tanner beetle. It's a, a giant longhorn beetle, which mainly flies in August. And this is an enormous thing. It's got like an alien looking eyes and these huge, great uh, antennae, which look like sort of ice cream cones all stuck together. Um, and that one lives in, in the roots of uh, trees as a larva and has this great, enormous grub, uh, which feeds in the, in the rotting wood and uh, down, down below ground. And then probably for several years and then emerges as the adult. This is a, a springtail. Now, springtails are one of those numerous invertebrates in all sorts of habitats and amongst leaf litter. Uh, if you sift through the leaf litter, I was with the uh, tray earlier, you'll find lots and lots of springtails. So this is a, a good food supply for a lot of uh, beetles. And there are some which particularly specialize in eating springtails. This is one which is very common. Uh, it's only a few millimeters long, but it has these enormous eyes. And this one hunts in the leaf litter by using it, these eyes to track down the springtail prey. Uh, this is another one called uh, Larissera, 
which is a slightly bigger one. Uh, this one also hunts for springtails, but it has normal size eyes, but it has these very, uh, long antennae. And if you look at the antennae, there's all these spikes on the antennae. And it uses these to, when it finds a springtail, it curls the antennae around and makes a trap and traps the springtail and then eats it. And this is yet another one called Leister, so uh, uh, another springtail stalking species. And this one will, I can see it has these big plate jaws with lots of spikes along the side. And this one will trap the springtail down against the ground and then eat it. So there's lots of, uh, it's a tiny world, but full of amazing adaptations and predators. If you get down there, you know, down there at ground level, use a magnifying glass or a hand lens. And there's an amazing world to discover, really incredibly beautiful creatures. It's a closer up view of the uh, of that one, the plate jaw beetle. You see, there's a big plate jaws on it. Other uh, aphids and other springtails and things like this are prey for all sorts of creatures. This is a, a little tiny rove beetle, a little stennis beetle, and some of these uh, live on dry land. A lot of them live on water, uh, sort of damp habitats and they're able to sh um, shoot along the surface of the water by ejecting a, a detergent from the end of their abdomen. And then this actually reduces the surface tension behind their body and actually shoots the beetle forward. So quite a fun thing to watch. So again, boggy habitats, water, any aquatic habitats are gonna be full of water and they're rich in life anyway. Uh, so there's gonna be lots and lots of beetles living in here. Uh, bog up on Dartmoor, uh, some of the leaf beetles which live in there, these little uh, uh, Danacea uh, type leaf beetles. This is one called Platymyrus. It hasn't got an English name. It's a rather beautiful thing. You can often find it on uh, bog bean flowers in the spring upon Dartmoor. And again, lovely metallic colours on them. In the water itself, though, there's all sorts of beetles. There's some huge great ones as well. It's almost as big as the stag beetle. This is a great silver water beetle. It actually traps the air on its uh, little hairs on its underside of its body and then it uh, takes its air supply down under the water. Uh, well, if you've done any pond dipping you may well come across this voracious predator, the great diving beetle and its larva below and this one is a beetle which will also eat tadpoles but it also attacks small fish. So uh, you know it's uh, things that are thought to you know, predate insects like fish can actually have the tables turned on them by uh, beetles such as this one, the great diving beetle. And again, these ones need to fly to find new ponds. And this is one that comes out usually at night again. It's a great diving beetle coming out of the pond and then propping itself up on its legs and whirring off into the air. And again, something which may well turn up in a light trap. And there's a little bit of video again of that if you looked on my YouTube collection. Again, in water, uh, one of the ones, an unusual one, the whirligig beetle, which lives on the top, on the surface of the water. So it has actually two pairs of eyes on each side. So it has a pair of eyes which can see above the water and then a pair of eyes which can see below. So its eyes are split in half. So it's perfectly adapted for living on the surface. Um, slugs, as I mentioned earlier, I might not have seen the most appetizing of food and probably some of you are about to have your tea, but I'm going to put you I'll show you some of the slug monkey ones. This is a, a buzzing snail beetle. This one has these long jaws here. This one hunts down slugs and snails to eat. Uh, the, uh, the violet ground beetles as well, which are general generalist predators, uh, but they will eat slugs. And the blue ground beetle, which I, I mentioned earlier on, uh, that one is a specialist slug muncher. So that one really does like its slugs. Um, this is a violet ground beetle eating a slug. Um, these ones can, this is one of, the, of these big ground beetles, this is the one you're most likely to see in the garden. Uh, they will live, they will eat all sorts of things and so they will munch the slugs in your garden so they're, they're really good to encourage. Uh, other, others in uh, hunt for snails and this is a, a little uh, ground beetle which actually has a pair of jaws a bit like a tin opener. So this one just actually munches, opens up the shell of the snail and eats the insides out. And that's a little thing called Lysenus. Now this is a glow worm. Now glow worms of course are beetles, uh, not worms. And this is the, the light of the female. So the female emits this light in summer evenings. And she is, she looks a bit like a sort of plated woodlouse, but uh, she has six legs and a pair of antennae there. 
glowworms start off life there again there's they eat mollusks so slugs and snails and this is the larva of a glowworm it lives for a couple of years and in that time it will hunt down slugs and snails and uh, again it like the blue ground beetle it injects digestive juices into the slug and dissolves it and then sucks up the insides so uh, that's the glowworm then after a couple of years uh, they emerge as adult glowworms this is the male looks a bit more a, a more of a normal beetle than the female and he can fly and you can see there that under his carapace of his head he has these enormous eyes and he has this sort of flat carapace over the top of them and that's thought to uh, cut out any uh, starlight and uh, light that's coming down on him from above while he's flying along and enables him to detect the, the faint glow of the female as she's glowing in the undergrowth. These beetles don't feed as adults, they only live for a few days, after all that two years of munching slugs and snails, and they live for a few days, the female here laying her yellow eggs in the soil, and they'll hatch into tiny little glowworm larvae and, and start the cycle again. Uh, a bit of roadkill here is by the A38. Now, den animals, again, that's a, a food supply for a lot of insects and beetles are amongst those. Uh, so if you, this is a pitfall trap set above, set near a, a animal corpse, and it attracts these sexton beetles, these black and, uh, black and orange beetles. And these ones work in pairs. They're actually in the evolutionary terms. They're one of the first married couples because they actually work as a couple. They pair up. They find a suitable food supply and then the pair will actually bury this, in this case, a little shrew, uh, bury it underground and then they will uh, lay their eggs on it. And unlike a lot of insects, which leave their eggs and then and fly off and leave them, they these actually look after their larvae and their larvae even call to them and they feed them a bit like baby birds. Quite, quite amazing things, it's the uh, sexton beetles. Others live in amongst dead corpses and dung and they're incredibly shiny. It's a little hysteria, a little clown beetle. And you can see here it's adapted for almost, you know, for it doesn't want to pick up all this gunk on it. So it's super shiny. So it can it can get through the, the dead animals or the dung and uh, still come out the other side looking clean. Ants nests are another place that uh, beetles live, um, which you wouldn't have thought they, they could live. And this is a wood ant nest. They're quite voracious predators, of course, wood ants. Uh, but there are certain beetles that live in amongst the, the ants' nest. This is a, a type of ladybird, a scarce seven-spot ladybird. And this one, uh, although the ants will have a go at it, they, they, can't, they won't actually attack it. And so the ladybird feeds on the aphids, which the ants tend. Uh, the scarce seven-spot ladybird, ladybird is very similar to the common seven-spot ladybird that you see. Uh, but the way you identify it has slightly bigger spots on the back of it is usually near wood ant nests and if you turn it upside down it has four spots underneath by its legs and the common seven spot ladybird only has two of those spots white spots there another species which lives in uh, ant in wood ant nests is this one it looks a bit like a ladybird it's a type of leaf beetle and the larva of this makes a little case which it can contract back into and it feeds in amongst the detritus in the nest uh, this is one uh, a strange looking beetle, tiny thing, smaller than an ant, which lives in uh, meadow ant nest, nests and it gets carried around by the ants. They seem to accept this little creature. I'm not sure exactly what it eats and it's quite a hard thing to spot, um, but you can find it in, in quite a few of the uh, meadow ant nests. Oil beetles, now these are a favourite of mine. These are coming out at this time of year, uh, the violet oil beetle. And these have a really unusual life history. So oil beetles will lay their eggs on emerge this time of year, they'll mate, and the female will dig a burrow in the ground and she can lay up to 40,000 eggs. And then these will turn into little larvae called triangulins because they have uh, three hooks on each foot. And here's one. And what these, things, these little larvae do is they wait on flowers and they attach themselves to any insects which visit the flower. And the only ones that survive are those that get onto certain sorts of solitary bee. They hitch a ride on the back, and then they get transported off to the bee's nest and they feed on the pollen in the host bee's nest. There's a little guide uh, from Bug Life. This, uh, if you look on the Bug Life website, you may well be able to get hold of that guide still, which covers all the British crown uh, oil beetles. They're called oil beetles because they produce the toxic oil from their skin and their mouth if they're disturbed and this again attracts another beetle this is a cardinal beetle and this one if it sees an oil beetle it will jump on the back and suck up some of this toxic 
uh, substance and then it enhances its own chemical defense system. So it's stealing some poison from another beetle. Just finish off by having a look at our garden. I uh, live in Buckfastley, and this is our garden when we moved in about sort of 20, 30 years ago now, 20, or just over 20 years. It was all quite trim and uh, not a huge amount of wildlife in there. And this is what it's like today. Uh, so our sons were just quite young boys in those days. Just Oscar was just born, and Barnaby was about four or five at the time, and a bit bigger now. Um, my wife Joyce there as well. And uh, for a while, I cleared out all the lawn and just let the garden go wild, uh, which is, is good for a certain time of year, but it does look a bit of a mess. My wife wasn't too keen at some points of the year. So between us now, we manage the garden. Joyce tidies it up and, uh, and plants some flowers and things like that. And I leave some scrappy bits around the edges and it works pretty well for the wildlife. Uh, a few years ago now, we uh, transformed it again from a wilderness area to a more formalized garden by importing various rocks and some tires here and making some tire garden raised beds and put in a path. So there's lots of nooks and crannies in there for things to live in. Uh, also put some sand in the uh, flower beds there to attract bees. And now we've got a, a wildlife garden, but it's also quite an attractive garden as well with lots of flowers. Uh, one patch I put of sand in soil. This was to attract mining bees to nest, and here's one, a little grey mining bee. You can see on it there's a little triangling of a violet oil beetle. And uh, as well as the, uh, the bees moving in, I get the insects, which uh, are cuckoo parasites like the oil beetle, in the, the nest of bees. So this is a bee fly, and these have moved in and they're living in our garden now. And it took a few years, but now I've got a little colony of oil beetles as well. So I've just got by the front door now I've got four or five oil beetles munching away on the celandines. Now, if you've got a garden, if you're managing for wildlife, I don't use any insecticides or slug killers and things like this. I mean, they're designed for killing or, or advertised for killing certain things, but they um, certainly insecticides will kill all the insects in your garden. So I, I wouldn't advise using any of those. Uh, try and outwit them. They also kill the predators of the insects and uh, decrease the numbers of those. So things like hedgehogs have declined. No one knows exactly why, but um, certainly insecticides must have played a part in this in reducing the abundance of insects in gardens. We've got a log pile in our garden. This is uh, teeming with life. Again, rotting wood, so there's lots of beetles and things which will be living in there. Uh, other insects as well, and this will attract predatory beetles. So all sorts of things will live in amongst the log pile. Uh, the compost bin, sort of overflowing a bit. And wherever you get decay, there's lots of nutrients being released. So there's lots of little, again, a lot of them are quite tiny little beetles, uh, but they're living in amongst that leaf litter and the, and the decaying compost. Uh, the ponds, of course, attract a few water beetles. Uh, my, our ponds primarily for frogs. And the frogs benefit, of course, so we get masses of frogs in our garden. From the rough areas around the garden, there's lots and lots of insects in there. So lots of prey for the frogs and then some water as well for them to breathe in. And again, it's like having little rough corners. So in our garden, there's a little patch by the wheelie bins, which is a bit, you know, is a bit scruffy. It's one of the bits I manage. Um, and it's a few bits of wood and some decaying vegetation. But these are the sort of places which there's masses of insects, lots of beetles living in there, lots of other insects, and that's prey for things like the frogs and toads and things which come into the garden. We've also got sort of an unofficial edge to the garden, so I managed just the, uh, the edges of the, uh, the path there. And where you get the vegetation hanging over some uh, bear, some tarmac there, you get a lot of a warm sort of habitat. And there's lots of things which live under there. So it's actually teeming. You lift up this mat of vegetation and it's teeming with life, including lots of little uh, ground beetles and other sorts of beetles which live in there. And so I just tidy it up at the, in the autumn each year, just trim it back and then just let it grow back in the summer. And this attracts a lot of, of beetles. This is... Uh, one which feeds on seeds, so I'm not too quick to uh, tidy up some of the plants, some of the weedy plants that uh, seed in the garden, because the insects like this, this uh, a little harpless ground beetle, and this one will feed on seeds. It has the mun big munching jaws there, able to crush up seeds. So uh, having sort of rough and being a little bit untidy of the, around the garden is a really good way to encourage things like beetles to live in there and all the other wildlife. There are some things which I don't tend to encourage because um, I quite like my rosemary in the garden 
And there is a beetle which I've, I haven't seen, luckily, in our garden, but I have seen it in Exeter. It's a very beautiful thing, um, the rosemary leaf beetle. Um, but this is an introduction from the Mediterranean, so it doesn't seem to have any of its predators here. And it will destroy, or it rather as larvae, will destroy any rosemary and lavender it comes across. So I, uh, I haven't seen one yet, but I would remove those if, if you want to keep your, keep your rosemary going. Also dead wood, in the, in, as well as the log pile, we've got some uh, logs uh, with lots of little nooks and crannies, so things can live under there, in it. And it's all um, from, when, from our, when our garden started, there was quite plain lawn. Now there's a lot of surface area. If you look at the, the structure of the garden, there's lots of nooks and crannies, little edge habitats. And this provides a huge surface area for all sorts of things to live in there. A lot of them you can't see most of the time. You have to really sort of root around to find them. But it becomes so much more diverse just by, just by doing this. Also bits of dead wood, and it might look a bit untidy, but you know, when I leave these little bits of standing dead wood, and there's lots of little beetles, little sort of like, like woodworm type beetles, which live in amongst this stuff. So I, I leave those bits of dead wood, standing dead wood and falling dead wood. All these different dead wood habitats attack, attract different beetles. Leaf litter, as I mentioned before, those springtails and things. Uh, leave, I leave piles of it around. I don't tidy it up too much because it is, again, it's a habitat with a lot of nutrients being released by the rotting leaves. There's lots of food in there for all sorts of insects and you will attract lots of insects, in there, particularly beetles. And again, these provide food for things like hedgehogs and, and frogs as well. So it's right up through the food chain. Uh, also, I grow quite a few native plants in the garden as well as some of the flowers. One of my favourite uh, ones is the flea bane, which is to attract bees. Uh, but also there's a, a flea bane tortoise beetle, and this one, little green beetle here. This one specialises in eating on this, eating this plant. It's a type of leaf beetle. And since I've had the flea bane in the garden, this beetle's appeared. I, I haven't really seen it anywhere else locally, but if you put the plants out there, the beetles will find them. And uh, also lichen and mosses. Uh, I first noticed this uh, by, I'd, I'd had some twigs which I used for photographing moths on, and I put these down on our log pile. And I noticed when the birds landed on these and then went up in the trees, they actually took the lichen spores or whatever it is with them. And now we've got lichen and mosses growing all over the trees. And again, this is another little edge habitat, lots of little nooks and crannies in there. And there's lots of tiny little insects which live in, the, in that habitat. So all amongst the mosses and lichens. Uh, just a couple of examples of that, some little predatory uh, ground beetles, which are arboreal ground beetles, which live under lichens and mosses on tree trunks. That's the end of the, uh, the talk. I'll just give you a, a couple of links. So this is uh, a link which we might like to investigate. This is the Wild About Gardens uh, booklet, which, and if you'd like, I think is a free, free copy go to the wildaboutgardens.org.uk link and you can order a copy there. Uh, we'll bring you back up because I think it's only just come out. I haven't seen a copy of it myself, uh, but it looks very good to me. And also have a look at the Den Wildlife Trust uh, Action for Insects uh, link, which is on their website. Uh, so if you go to the Den Wildlife Trust uh, website and then look for that link and find out more about what you can do. There'll be lots of information on there on what you can do to help beetles and other insects in your gardens. Okay, thanks very much for listening. And now I'll hand back, well, that's my website. If you want to download those links uh, to the beetle guides, have a look at my website, johnwalters.co.uk. Uh, thanks very much for listening and I'll hand back to Zoe now. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a look. Well, that was fantastic, John. Thank you so much and personally, even though I've sort of worked for Devon Marsh Trust for a couple of years, I've still learned a, a huge amount. And I'll certainly remember that uh, analogy you did about sort of bugs have um, straws and beetles have jaws. <laughs> um, I'll actually have a question on that. So what is a ladybird then? If it's, is it a bug or a beetle? Because oh, people often yeah, call them look. ladybugs. Well, do you know what they do? They, uh, have you seen them eating or not? Uh, I don't think I have actually, actually, no. They actually chew up. Um, aph aphids, so they're beetles. Oh, excellent. Well, that's solved that question then. Yeah, so yeah. Just have a close look at their jaws and then you'll sort it out. Brilliant.
Well, there's quite a few questions, as you can imagine, and some of them are really interesting, and I certainly would want to know the answers. So I'll get cracking, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. So the first question is, how many of the 4,000 species of the UK beetles have you seen alive? Oh, uh, I don't know, actually. I'm not, I'm not really much of a lister, actually. I, <laughs> I take a lot of time photographing um, things, but I've seen ooh, maybe about 1,000 of them. I mean, I've got friends who who go out searching for all these things, and they've seen you know a few thousand of the British beetles. Well, I've I've maybe seen a thousand. I tend to sort of get diverged into looking at their life histories rather than looking for every single one. That's I think fair enough. Uh, the next question is: Do all beetles fly? No, they don't. No, some can't. Some haven't got wings, um, uh, like the female glowworm, and some species just don't have wings either. Uh, like that one I showed you, which was munching up the snail, the Lycinus, uh, hasn't got wings, so it, it can't fly. So, you know, they not all of them can fly. No. That's really interesting. Uh, so the next question is, what benefit does the metal colour uh, give a beetle? So why, why do they have it? That ref reflective colour, I'm not sure, actually. Um, I don't know if anyone knows for certain. Uh, it's, some of them, like the violet ground beetle, are really reflective, and they seem to reflect a lot of blue light. And it may be that they're reflecting blue light and absorbing more red light and they're active at night and sort of warm to, to warm themselves up. But uh, that's one theory, but I, I don't know the, the actual answer. I don't know if anyone does, but they perhaps look lovely. <laughs> yeah, perhaps it's something to do with them attracting mates or do they not tend to do that? Um, they often use pheromones to attract, so you sense to attract, or well, some of them do. Um, I'm not sure somehow some of them attract their mates. Um, it could be a visual thing, um, but they, um, a lot of them are quite nocturnal and live in sort of odd habitats, so they don't, they're not like butterflies which are showing off their colours so much. Um, they tend to be, it's more like to be concealment, because some of the reflective things actually reflect a lot of the colours from around them, so they actually be, they look bright on your hand, but put them in the vegetation like that rose chafer, and they disappear because they're reflecting all the colours around them, so that it might be a part of a camouflage thing as well, or probably a combination of all those things. And an, an unending mystery, perhaps, something <laughs> for someone else to discover. Um, so the next question is, uh, do you see the brilliant Carabus nitens, or nitens, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, I call it the jazz beetle. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm not sure, it can, it's very rare in Devon, but I have seen it, yeah, in Dorset, um, New Forest, I've seen it quite a lot, and I remember the first time I found one in a pitfall trap. I thought it was like a jewel which had, <laughs> someone had dropped in the track. They really are absolutely like a, like a beautiful jewel. And um, then I got it out, it's a stunning beetle. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, one of the top ones to see if you get into beetles. Fantastic. So the next question is, at dusk, I sometimes see and hear a large flying beetle, which makes a loud buzzing sound. Could this be a cockchafer? It could be, yeah. It depends what time of year, so in May, uh, when the May bugs are flying, they can be, they fly at dusk. Uh, there's a summer chafer as well, a slightly smaller one, which comes out about midsummer, uh, which is quite common. Uh, the tanner beetle, which I showed you earlier on, that's a big buzzing thing, and that comes out mainly in August time. So they're the big beetles, and plus the dung beetles as well, uh, which you might see as well, some of those big dung beetles. So they're the main ones which you'd see flying at dusk, but it does depend on what time of year. In May, it's almost certainly going to be the May bug or cock chafer. Okay, interesting. Um, the next question is, what are the tiny black beetles on dandelions? They are pollen beetles. You know, I, didn't, I didn't have time to show everything, but if you look in, there's lots of little, again, beetles eat all sorts of stuff, and there's a whole group of beetles called pollen beetles. They're quite hard to identify, and they all look much the same. But you, if you look in flowers, all sorts of flowers, you'll find hundreds of them, tiny little things, little black dots. And that's what they, they feed on pollen, as their name suggests. I'll certainly remember that next time I see a dandelion. Um, the next question is, is your book, The Wildlife of Dartmoor, available for sale anywhere? It's out of print now, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, unless you, I think the Dartmoor Preservation Association did have the last copies. I diverted people to them over the last, I'm not sure if they got any left, but they had the last, last batch of them. So unfortunately, it's out of print now. Yeah, the last precious copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they've sold them all, but you know, they may still have a copy. That's your only chance. OK, uh, and the next question is, what are the projections on the legs for? 
the projection, the little spikes and things. Um, some of them for gripping. Um, a lot of beetles have um, little spikes and a lot of insects, in fact, do. And this is for helping them to grip onto uh, walls and vegetation, that sort of thing. Um, and some of them are used for ca catching prey or for holding on to their mates or mating. So a variety of things. So it's mainly for gripping onto things. It's their, they're like an extension to their, um, well, their claws as well as, because they've got such long legs, they need to have various other projections to help them hold on. A bit like Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and the next question is, uh, can any beetles give a painful bite to humans? Uh, I mean, a female stag beetle could, yeah. And the males have got those big impressive jaws, but they won't actually be able to puncture your skin. Um, so that's probably the only one in this country. I mean, abroad, there's bound to be, you know, lots of big munchy beetles, particularly things like longhorn beetles, which can chunk, chop through wood to get out of mm. them. They could give you a nip if they felt so inclined. But generally speaking, the beetles we've got in our country are pretty harmless. Perhaps wear gloves just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and one person said, I do see a few oil beetles in the garden. Is there anything I can do to improve the habitat for them and ensure yeah. I don't use, lose them? Yeah, I mean, uh, what you need to concentrate, concentrate on having is the bees. So you may not notice the bees that are nesting. They may be nesting in your lawn. So encourage them. I mean, I put a bit of sand in our, in our flower beds, just incorporated in the soil. So it made it easier for the mining bees to mine in there. Um, also, where you've got mining bees, have a bit of slightly thicker vegetation, uh, maybe grow some celandines if you haven't got celandines, because the oil beetles love to feed on the celandines, the adults. So, uh, yeah, have a bit of vegetation like celandines and things for them to feed on. But you're great if you've got them in your garden. I'm pleased to have them in our garden. So, so. Yeah, we've got a few sort of in a, on a virgin in my house, and so it's, it's quite a pleasure to see them around. Yeah, great. Um, someone said, is it okay to use fence paint? Fence paint. I don't know. <laughs> I've never used fence paint. I don't, I don't. It depends how toxic it is and whether that watches in, but I presume it'll say on the tin. Often it says, you know, harmful to wildlife or whatever. So, so I think I generally know. anything chemically treated is best stayed away, I think. Yeah, probably best to away from the, the actual garden anyway. Mm. Um, someone said, how can I get the blue ground beetle into my garden to eat all the slugs? <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you'd be pretty lucky because unless you've got a back onto an ancient woodland where they, one of the few woodlands where they occur, they weren't. But, you know, encouraging things like the violet ground beetle and the devil's coach horse and things like that will, uh, will eat slugs. Um, but also encouraging things like hedgehogs and creatures like that and frogs and toads. Um, so having a more wilder, maybe slightly more messy garden, um, which, uh, which attracts predators in uh, is probably the best way. The blue ground beetle is is a very rare creature. I mean, not many people would have that in their garden. Fair enough. Uh, the next question is, what is the best thing to do for creating a beetle habitat in a very small garden? So what's your sort of top tip? In a small garden, I suppose it depends how small, but I mean, some rotting wood is quite a good way, depending on where you are. So, uh, or plants which, uh, some, some leaf litter, you know, it, you know, it's just a small patch of, of leaves and things just rotting down. If you've got a small patch, just a small tray or whatever, will attract beetles in there to live. So yeah, you can do these things on a smaller scale. So it's a lot of things I've talked about, but it could be just a small piece of wood or it's a small patch of, of leaf litter, that sort of thing, or you know, or, or providing providing little nooks and crannies or some seeds which are letting things go to seed, which is right track some seed eating beetles. And that actually leads really nicely onto my next question, which is, are some species of tree or rotting wood better for beetles than others? Some are, yeah. I mean, some beetles really like, I mean, they like native trees like oaks and uh, things like that. Oak and beech, because, you know, they, they do attract a lot of specialist beetles. Other ones are more generous and feed on all sorts of rotting wood. Uh, but, you know, some of the, you know, I suppose, the things which, you know, lived in there, live in the wild woods of, of what before we sort of decimated all the woodlands, uh, these sort of big oak woodlands, they're, they're some of the, the best habitats. Based on the New Forest and Windsor Great Park, uh, have got these really ancient trees in them and they've, they've got an amazing diversity of very, very rare beetles that live only in those sites now because there's been that continuation of, of dead wood, ancient dead wood habitats for 
you know, since the last ice age. Wow. So old and native is the way to go. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and the last question is, will you do any more ground beetle guides with Mark Telfer? Uh, will I? Um, I don't know. My, we've sort of diverged off into to different things. We did a few. It'd be nice to do a few more, um, but I might have to, Mark's very busy with his work now and I'm busy doing other things. So maybe when we retire, we might <laughs> finish them off. The passion and work never stops, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to say uh, a really big thank you to you, John. Um, it's been incredibly interesting and I've certainly learned a lot. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone else for coming and for all your questions. They've been really interesting as well. Um, and I'd like to say, uh, based on what John said, is that the Royal Horticultural Society and the Wildlife Trust have teamed up to create this um, Bring Back the Beatles guide, which gives you an idea of why beetles are important, a bit about their ecology, but also how you can help them in their gar your garden. So the way you download that is um, you go to wildaboutgardens.org.uk and you can download the free guide there. Um, and also take action for insects. So obviously beetles are important, but so are bugs and other insects and other wildlife. So if you take action for insects, you can download a free pack, which gives you more ideas for how you can help them and just help wildlife in general, really. So I'd like to say, obviously, thank you again. And if you've enjoyed our event, please sort of have a look at our other events on our website, on our What's On page. And thank, thanks again and good evening to you all. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Okay, thanks, Zoe. Thank um, you. That's good. Okay, I'll, I'll go and have my tea now. <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs>